Hey, Christian here. I am making a video series about how to make an awesome shmup. And guess what? The design part can be a bit tricky. That's why I'm asking cool indie devs about how they did it. This is the fifth and last interview in the series and today our guests are Ebo and Ebroski from System Erasure, the minds behind Zero Ranger and more recently Void Stranger. Before we begin, a quick disclaimer, the footage in the background is going to be mostly me having fun with the game and I'm not a great player and so you probably want to make sure you're gonna have a talk with your kids about it before you watch. I will splice in a two-all playthrough by Ectane who has been supporting this series quite a lot with you know additional professional footage. I would like to thank him for that and you can thank him too by subscribing to his channel. Also, Zero Ranger and Void Stranger are both games that can be potentially spoiled. We made sure not to reveal any critical secrets, um, and I think we did a pretty good job, but I just wanted to give you a heads up in case you want to go into those games completely blind. Finally, this interview will be available as an audio-only version if you want to listen to it like a podcast. Uh, the link is gonna be as always down in the doobly-doo. But now, without any further ado, a warm welcome to System Erasure. Hello. I'm a Brosgi. I programmed the grand majority, I mean, the entirety of Zero Ranger, and I composed its soundtrack and I designed it with, in tandem with Ebo. And uh, I was also the musician and like a idea rubber duck and assisting programmer for Void Stranger. I like music and games. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, my turn. Hi, I'm Eppo, and uh, I'm the graphic uh, artist guy behind Zero Ranger, and also helped the second half of the design, I guess. Uh, uh, you basically did the second half. And I was the one <laughs> who was responsible for programming the voice ranger, and yeah, I guess that's, that's it. I, so, so, so wait, you switched jobs, so now the other guy is doing the programming? Um, basically, yeah. yeah, basically we decided that uh, I should uh, study some, uh, or at least familiarize myself with the programming side of Game Maker. So, That's amazing. So I had yeah. to step up. One wow. thing led to another, and he programmed the entire game. <laughs> it was just like a test project, and suddenly a game popped out, right? Pretty much. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, okay, so let's first talk a little bit about Void Stranger, I would suggest, because that's a game that just came out, and I think like a lot of people want to maybe know something about it, or should maybe know about it. Um, it's a very different game from... Um, uh, from uh, uh, Zero Ranger, right? Mm -hmm. It's a completely different genre. Uh, how how did you decide? Like after spending so much so much time uh, with uh, Shmup, why did you decide to go to a very different genre? Mm, I think it was mostly uh, the, the initial decision was just me doing some experimentation and stumbling into the main mechanic, the gameplay mechanic of the voice stranger. And mm -hmm. uh, then, I, then I pretty much realized, okay, I could maybe build a game, a small game around this simple mechanic. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, small, do, small game. Do not laugh. Oh, oh wow. yeah, well, let's just say that it, we kind of got carried away again. <laughs> Yeah. It seems to be like a running problem with with uh, with you guys, right? Yes. It was. Well, actually, it was in half of the time it took Zero Ranger to be carried away into a big. Uh, that's <laughs> extremely low bar, Epro. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not ninety percent of that time, but it's fifty percent of that time. So if if you take the dots and put them into the graph, you see we are approaching maximum velocity with our game project. <laughs> that's, that's true, yeah, yeah. You're lowering the development times. Uh, to, maybe to explain the joke for people uh, uh, listening in. So uh, Zero Ranger has been in development for like 10 years, is that correct? Uh, before release, yeah. Yes. Yes. So you started in 2008? I think, yeah. Yeah. And, I... and then released in 
2018, right? Yes. Wow. That's, that's a hell of a development cycle. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did that go? Well, it started normally as a hobby. Mm -hmm. Just making a shmup with a friend. I, I think I got introduced to Ebo during that time. Like, we didn't really know each other before the project started. And we just kind of became friends over time developing Zero Ranger. And uh, both of us were passionate enough over time to notice that we should actually turn this into a full thing. And uh, in 2016, we did like the big decision to actually make that game commercial and turn it into a job. We put on the big boy pants, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> The pants of the big boy. Okay, so you worked for on a shmup for ten years, and then after ten years, you did the research map, and then it was uh, at least the community received it very positively. Um, and then you did like this little side project that is kind of like a puzzle game now, like a top-down uh, Sokoban Zelda dungeon-style game, and that took five years to develop. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. The thing is, like, I'm really struggling to talk about about Void Stranger because, from what I've seen so far, it's like kind of like a game that has like a lot of secrets and surprises. So I don't know how much you want to talk about Void Stranger because it's kind of like the uh, it's kind of like something that is very easily spoiled, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I could probably best summarize the game as it's it's a mystery and uh, hmm. it's. It's not a game for everyone. That, not that Zero Ranger was a game for everyone, but well, um, let's say that if you have played Zero, Ranger, Zero Ranger, you you probably know what kind of stuff you can expect. Yeah, it does share similarities with Zero Ranger, just because we are very fond of like hiding secrets and rewarding players for experimenting with things, basically. Like, giving them very tangible rewards for that. I, I can yeah. definitely see the, the similarities to uh, to Zero Ranger. I mean, Zero Ranger also has, like... There, Zero Ranger goes places. Like, it's... it's, <laughs> it's It may be on the surface, it seems like a schmuck, but it, it's, it's, it does some really fantastic stuff that is, that is um, made people uh, call Zero Ranger something like uh, the undertale of, of schmucks, right? Yeah. I don't know if that's that's per, that's a good analogy. I don't know, but it's it's certainly a, it experiments a lot with from what I've seen is it experiments a lot with like the uh, structure of the game. Like it kind of challenges you know what the game how the game is packaged, so to speak. That yeah, part that is. is I, I don't think that yeah. it's necessarily a bad comparison, just a loaded one. Hmm. It is a loaded and kind of a goofy one when you think about the main yeah, interaction but, in Undertale. Yeah, but in the end, it's the, it's the same kind of thing if you say it's something is a Dark Souls like or something. You just gotta you, yeah. you just gotta roll with it. So you you started in two thousand eight with with maps. How did you uh, like? What were your inspirations uh, creating Zero Ranger? What were did, were you guys already into maps when developing Zero Ranger, or is that something that that you kind of like discovered as you went along? Yeah, personally, I was really drawn into SMAPs when I started playing Ikaruka on GameCube. And mm. uh, I just, I, I remember spending uh, over 400 hours on it back in, wow. back in the day. And uh, once I SMAP uh, got their claws on me, I started playing other small, smaller freeware games such as, such as Chorenza and Guxt. Chorensha is kind of a perfect game of its kind. If, 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 if you have played Chorensha, you know at least the old version. There is pretty much no variation in the background. But even still, you can pretty much memorize the enemy layouts of the each level mm -hmm. without any trouble. Because they are just so intuitive. Yeah, you get yeah. like these very memorable encounters, I guess, right? They are kind of like a dance, you know? They are a rally game. <laughs> yeah. 
funny you should mention this because uh, Danbo, I think, also talked about uh, the, the rhythm of the attacks that it's kind of like feels a bit more like a dance when you're when you're fighting the enemies. Yeah, I was thinking about some parts in Char and Shah in particular where the enemy design leads you to one corner of the screen and then it brings out like the same formation of enemies but mirrored so you're kind of like swaying left and right. Hmm. It, it does that is one of the things it does and it's pretty nice yeah. So something I notice is that um in especially in Zero Ranger um you are kind of like ref there's lots of references in Zero Ranger to other shmups right like um there's I mean you you mentioning Ikaruga makes totally makes sense because it's like there is um, like the second level feels kind of like the second level in Ikaruga where you have like all the boxes that you have to navigate through like this very labyrinthian kind of situation. Uh, there's obviously like um, the bosses. Some of the bosses are like the ship from Gradius, and one boss is the ship from R Type. It's like these very very obvious references to 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 shmups, and it kind of like almost feels to me that Zero Ranger is kind of a shmup about shmups about the genre. Is that something that that's, uh, that you guys started out um, developing, or is that something that crept in as you as you as you spent more time with the game? It definitely didn't start as something we decided on that the game should have all these references. I think it started with the R type of boss battle ship when mm. I, I'm not sure which one of us was like that's kind of like the ship from R type. Shouldn't uh, and then the ball started kind of rolling, uh, and we figured uh, that maybe the first stage mini boss should be Gradius ship just for fun. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Which one of us started it? Which one that is, is the lost Which time. one is to blame? <laughs> yeah, it's basically we're the same person. Another thing that I I, I mean something that really um, unifies um, Void. Stranger and Zero Ranger is like the both of these two games have, are very kind of low-fi in many ways. They they, they um, have like these self-imposed or I guess they are self-imposed restrictions on you know the amount of colors that you're using and the resolution that you're working with. Yeah, they are. Oh, how did that happen with Zero Ranger? How did you decide? I mean, it's, it, has, it has this like very striking uh, orange and green color palette. How that how did that happen? That was probably just an accident. <laughs> I picked, I picked some colors in paint and looked at them and said, yeah, this is fine. And uh, they, yeah. they were actually refined over the years, thanks to Epra. Yeah, I, I think it was probably that Gux the inspiration, which is like a really big part of why Zero Ranger came to be. I think the single biggest influence in starting Zero Ranger was Gust. So it's kind of like this lo-fi shmup from, uh, from the creator of... Um... Is it from the creator of um... Cave Story? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also Carol Blaster. But yeah, yeah, that 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 was the biggest starting inspiration for that game. Yeah, since I, I was one that doing the drawings and wanted to keep things as simple as possible because I didn't then really still don't have much experience with actual art doing actual art things, so to speak. I just put pixels on MS Paint and hope for the best. <laughs> I mean, that's what, to some extent, that's what everybody does, right? <laughs> I hope so. so. So you basically, you you kind of like very spontaneously decided like, oh, this, this is kind of like a color palette that appeals to me and it became like such a foundational um, stone for the entire look of the game. Is that how it worked? Yeah, pretty much. Because the thing is that that, that, that I found so so fascinating is that it's it's kind of like, it's not just something that is like applied like a filter on top of the game, but it's, it feels like so integral to the identity of the game because like it's even in, it's in the name to so it's because there's like zero ranger and there's like the orange. Oh the, my the god! I just realized. <laughs> kidding. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Stop the podcast! <laughs> <laughs> So, so is that? I guess, I guess that's something that that you kind of like. Once it was in there, you guys kind of went along with that and and built on top, right? Yeah, just just leaned on on everything as much as as, yeah. as much as possible. As you may know, Zero Ranger was not called Zero Ranger until the final year of development, like mm -hmm. the final half year of development, because the 
earlier unfortunate name for the game was Final Boss, and it was a search engine nightmare. Searching for Final Boss? Yeah, I managed to spoil some games for myself when I wanted to know what people <laughs> think about our game. You just, you just have to specify Final Boss shmup. And then you find it. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm sure there's no video games that turn into shmups in their <laughs> final segment. So you did. You said at some point you said, okay, nobody will find my game if it's called Final Boss, so we have to change it to something else, right? Yeah. That was basically and it, what we are around it, at, yeah. It brought us lots of agony until we, <laughs> we just realized that we kind of had the perfect name all along. Yeah, that's also true. Zero Ranger was a concept from... I think all the way from 2014, if not 13. Yeah. So, so you kind of already had the name in the game, and you just like picked, plucked a name of the of, of Zero Ranger from from the actual script, right? Yes. Um, okay. One last question, maybe about Zero Range before we go to get into your development process, because I'm you know I'm really interested in that part. Um, but something that I heard you talk about is um, the accessibility. That this was such an important uh, aspect of of developing Zero Ranger that you want to create a shmup that is kind of accessible and that people can find their way into easier. Um, can you speak to that? Like, what what kind of changes did you make to make the game more accessible? Ah, uh, my favorite part. Uh, I have a lot of friends that you would call normies, and what I would <laughs> often <laughs> what I would often do when I was developing Zero Ranger is when they were curious about my video game. I would just give them my laptop and make them play it. And that was a great insight in like how would people look at the game and try to like wrap their head around the game, especially if they had no idea about like the arcade culture that is very much in the DNA of shoot 'em ups or has been. And then I started to kind of realize that our game is pretending to be an arcade game without actually being a one, and it might never be an arcade game. That led into renaming some of the concepts, like we removed credits. That was like a very simple thing to rename. They turned into these weird orb lives, and it just kind of rolled from there. Is there anything I'm forgetting, Ebo? Part of this accessibility was also giving... Uh, other kinds of motivations towards completion, not just yeah. having a high score, but also uh, a big, big narrative and a bit, a bit more progression, like with power ups. Yeah, but it's kind of funny since when I'm, I look back at Zero Ranger and these accessibility things, and they are kind of just baby steps and. Uh, Maybe if we had started with the thought of having uh, these accessibility options, we have we could probably have implemented them more elegantly, so to speak. Yeah. So the game is like kind of like a repackaged arcade game in its final form. I I really like that idea because see that's that was kind of like my theory that i also had like when when coming into shmups is where it's like i feel like the the actual content like the actual gameplay of, of shmups is kind of like really well developed but it's kind of like the packaging that is kind of like still needs work because it's still like very embedded in this idea of arcades yes yeah. I, I felt like I, I had like this these a lot of aha moments where i saw zero ranger with like for example uh, maybe it's for people who are not quite familiar with zero ranger it's like you can unlock basically continues so um, the more you play the game the more continues you have available so you kind of have like this progression system happening right yeah and it's that's not even an original idea a lot of games before us did that concept but like yeah. i was kind of surprised how few games did that because when i played games that had that system i was like very hooked because i'm something of a casual myself <laughs> Uh, the restructuring of Zero Ranger kind of pandered to my own tastes, oh. and it became more like a character action game, as some people call it, than oh. a shmup. Because when you die in Zero Ranger, when you lose all your health, that used to be lives, and now it's health, uh, you are taken back to a checkpoint. Mm. And that is also an idea I lifted straight from Judgment Silver Sword, because mm. it personally... 
it really motivated me to play more and get better when the game just simply didn't let me pass if I wasn't good to good enough to clear that wave. Yeah, that, and that's the one one of those age old things with uh, when uh, different developers port their arcade moves to consoles, they either uh, give almost no continues or it's o- o- only free play, and uh, neither of those. Uh, types uh, really communicate to the player how you're supposed to play or what kind yeah, of there is... play is actually fun to you yeah they have had a conveyance problem in well they have trusted their audience to know like what is the arcade culture but as we know i don't know how this is per country but like finland barely ever has had an arcade scene and I think arcades in general are kind of coping. Yeah, I, we have kind of like similar problem here in Germany as well because I think Germany they, they count as as like um, um, gambling basically because you have to throw in coins to play, right? So you can only play arcades when you're 18 and these kinds of people usually don't, they're no longer interested in arcades. I mean, if you only lose money, is that gambling? <laughs> mm. I mean, I would say yes, that's that's exactly what gambling is. <laughs> no, no, but I, I really like that point because it's, again, exactly the kind of thought process I had myself when, when looking at shmups is like this kind of like, okay, I have a free play so you can just like continue without any kind of repercussions, continue like credit feed through the entire game, which mm. means the game will be over in a, very quickly and then it's like, okay, what am I going to do now? Or you have like no continues, and then you just it's just you banging your head against the wall constantly, and then eventually giving up because you're not good at the game, right? It is kind of a, two harsh extremes to present to the player, and neither of them are really very good at teaching the middle part of the game to the player. Yeah, like like leaving the the player with a sense of okay, here's the path forward. Here's how I'm gonna improve. Here's something I already achieved. You know, just giving them an idea of, of some kind of progression. Exactly. Um, I, I was fascinated by one thing that I didn't see that often, um, which is in Zero Ranger you can also like start at a level. You can just like skip straight to a level yeah. with any without any. Uh, at least it feels like it, there is no kind of punishment for this. It just you just start at level two now. Yeah, all you're going to lose is your score. And like you if you wanted to do full runs with big scores, then of course you'd start at level one. But if you were to start from a later level, there is no punishment for that. Again, that's kind of like something that, that is kind of an evolution that other genres already made through, like in Super Mario, you know, the first Super Mario it's kind of like the one CC thing, but in Super Mario three or Super Mario World Exactly, it's to... a very home console kind of thing, and like, I think because shmups have kept their grip on the arcade feel so hard, they didn't often experiment with that, or like, there are there might be punishments involved. So the game basically one way or another signals you that this is the wrong way to play. Um, maybe too, because when we're talking about accessibility, so I'm kind of curious, did, did you take these lessons then um, to Void Stranger when you work in Void Stranger? Is that also, was that also a concern when working on that game? Well, in Void Stranger, there is practically no execution or skill level in, in how fast you put your inputs. You can just think your every move as long as you want. And I kind of wondered... Um, how you could do uh, ac- uh, proper accessibility options in puzzle games that aren't just uh, skip a level. Because uh, if you want to make a puzzle easier, that's entirely different puzzle, very likely. Uh, yes. that's, uh, that's not always feasible. I-, I had to think about this when playing through Void Stranger because it's like there's like, it's, for example, uh, some, you can, there's like, chasms and you can fall into chasm and you die Mm -hmm. or chasm i guess is the english word um but you have like um when you walk into into the hole uh, it's you you know the character struggling a little bit and you can undo that move so there's a bit of a leeway there you you aren't completely immediately punished for for pressing the wrong direction that that was actually one of our earliest testers first things they said that you should be able to just step back if you, if you were about to go into the pit. 
and we were like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't possibly imagine how sadistic this game would be if <laughs> if it didn't have this one thing. Yeah, it was. Oh. It is a really good feature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was like, oh, it, also like the implementation is really good because it's not like you know, it's not like an undo button that you push, but it feels like very, you know, you're familiar with this kind of things from Zelda or something. You know, it's like, oh, the character's about to fall, I'm gonna move back. It feels more like an action RPG. Yeah, and it kind of makes pits feel as dangerous as they have to feel, like without making them like instant death. Yeah, it it adds kind of like a a variable danger state. Yeah, I wonder if there's a better term for that, but it, it reminds me of the bump system in Zero Ranger, actually. Oh, can you speak to that? Because I heard somewhere about this, and I I can, what? How does the bump system work in Zero Ranger? So, for a long time in development, when you would touch an enemy that was tangible, you would lose a health point. But uh, somewhat late in development, I just realized that, I don't know, I'm not that big of a fan of uh, contact damage for granted that is uh-huh. like, has been in a lot of old games. And I realized uh, collision with enemies doesn't need to be as dangerous as with actual bullets, which are the instruments that the enemies are trying to kill you with. So... I designed a system based on Strania. I think Strania had kind of a system where you would have to rub yourself off to a wall and to an enemy for about a second before you would actually take a damage point. Strania is still a machina, right? That, that, that's the schmuck? Yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I further simplified that into Zero Ranger where you would bump into an enemy and you would start glowing green if you would bump into an enemy again during a short period you'd glow orange and if you'd bump one more time you will take a damage so you you'll have to bump into an enemy three times within a short short time to lose a health hmm. and it it retains the feeling of danger from enemies but doesn't make it overtly punishing and that's why I compared it to the pit time in Void Stranger. It makes the pits feel dangerous, but they are not immediately punishing. That is fascinating. Also, a very fascinating implementation for for a shmup. So, okay, so we're talking about Void Stranger. There's also because like there, okay, there's some parts that are very um, like give you like uh, um, a lot of leeway. They give you like these kind of like um, uh, gaps or the opportunities to recover when you're about to make a mistake. But there's other aspects of the of the puzzling which seem like, for example, there is no way to undo other things that you do in the game because you can kind of like break the puzzle, right? So you have to restart, mm-hmm. and, and and there's no undo button or anything like this, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, when when I play I play puzzle games that have an undo, well, ex- for example, when I played Papa Is You, and there mm-hmm. and there is uh, very often I had this. Um, but choice paralyzed, so to speak, when uh, mm. there were multiple ways to move, and uh, when 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 I was feeling at even a little bit um, uncertain, I would undo just the whole thing and start or start over. And uh, mm. uh, obviously, that uh, I think that that's all obviously the point of Papa is you. But I was personally, I was going for more. Long term stress, so to speak, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because if you have the undo button, you're it feels you are like constantly uh, debating whether you should whether this move was the right one or not. But mm. in Voice Stranger, the, because there is no undo button, and you you might and the only way to reset the room is to either complete uh, com- complete it or die in a way or another and I think that creates more uh, how should I put adventures spirit perhaps and mm. I think at least for myself it makes uh, solving the puzzle is easier if I just throw myself at it and try to figure out uh, the moves as I go instead of just mm. watching 
the whole, whole puzzle from the beginning to end before doing anything. It was just kind of something I felt that it's really hard to explain without going sure. too much into detail. But uh, I mean, Void Strangers, uh, I, I I have such a respect from you for you guys because it's uh, such a difficult game to discuss. I think uh, because like all. Of, Hmm. Okay, so maybe to clarify to people to um, listening to this, this is a kind of like a game that that does a little bit of a um, is a bit of a uh, there was a game inscription that just that was just released um, some time ago that was very popular, which also kind of like does similar things, not quite the same thing, but also similar things. Where it's like the, the, what the game is changes as you go on, right? I haven't played that one, but I, yes, I've oh, I, okay, I, I, heard about it before, yes. Uh, and, I mean, Zero Ranger was also doing these kinds of things, or maybe something like, I don't know, Metal Gear Solid, where it's like, um, uh, suddenly, you know, the entire game seems to be, like, falling apart or changing or uh, underneath you. Yeah, I, I uh, think that that's part of our, I don't know if you could call it a design philosophy or something, but we are trying to look at the not just the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, but also the overall experience you're having with the game. I mean, something that I really love, and I think that's something that we can spoil. It's something that I think we, we, we can discuss. And that is, for example, that the game, like part of the game is shutting down the game. Mm -hmm. Occasionally. Sometimes you, you do something and the game just quits. And, and you're back to the desktop, which blows. I've never seen anything like a game behave this way before. That, that just blows my mind. I'm sure it has been done plenty of time before. I'm kind of so used to Void Stranger doing that. that <laughs> it blows my mind that people get blown by that. I was like, this is the killer feature? <laughs> the game quits on you. That's the killer feature. But intentionally. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so let us maybe discuss the thing that I'm actually really the most interested in, and that is kind of a talking about your development process. Um, so first of all, uh, both Void Stranger, but also Zero Ranger were created in um, a game maker, is that correct? That is correct. How did you arrive at Game Maker? What, what, what was the decision making behind Game Maker? Uh Simply because I had used it all my life to make video games. <laughs> and I built all my skill in GameMaker and GameMaker has matured with me, so it has never feel, felt too constraining. It works. So can you give us like an overview of the tool workflow um, for how you created the levels and the enemies and bullet patterns and these kinds of things in Zero Ranger? So the level design is done in Game Maker's own room editor. And it is littered with these spawner objects for each enemy that are... <clears throat> you could probably do it differently. You could like... Well, the, the basic logic is the first level of Zero Ranger is a very long vertical room mm -hmm. that scrolls quite slowly. The illusion of speed is made in like scrolling the backgrounds and such. Mm -hmm. It is just scrolling back backgrounds and all that. But the camera also physically scrolls through the room. So it can hit these spawner objects that then spawns the enemies. So the process, at least in the beginning of Zero Ranger, has been very visual mm -hmm. in creating the enemy patterns. And the the longer we went on and the more complex the levels became, I started doing some enemy patterns more in the side of uh, just scripting in Game Maker language. Like making general spawner objectives and choreographing the attacks from the script itself. So it's a mixture of um, the, the room editor in Game Maker and also additional some additional scripting, right? Yeah, it's all done in basically game maker language, so there's no nothing too fancy, but it it kind of shifts from the room editor into the code whenever it's most comfortable. Like a very good example of what is done in the code is in the beginning of stage four, when you are being swarmed by these fleets that fly in like a snake-like formation. Mm -hmm. uh, that is all code 
cause <laughs> I wouldn't even imagine how to do that in the room editor, but like yeah, it's just a it, lot of objects flying at you at very high speed, right? Exactly, and they are coming from all directions. Just place them in the circle around the player. Yeah, they are like they are do doing all kinds of wacky. Shit. It, like, but like as long as your enemies are coming from the front and maybe from the sides, the spawner objects are like good enough in doing their work. And well, even behind. Everything in stage one is basically spawner objects. Oh, huh, interesting. Like, but like, whenever you're getting more fancy, you might start feeling limited in the uh, room editor, or more like it might become too confusing to be worth it. Mm -hmm. It's all about like organization. So uh, if you're using the room editor and you place those spawner objects, uh, do you see like a visual preview of what the level will look like? Or is that more abstract kind of uh, preview? It's, it's pretty abstract, like mm -hmm. enemies overlapping each other in a way that doesn't make sense. Uh, I will do have to say uh, I'm not using the layer system in GMS2 because GMS1 didn't have that. So uh. it might be ugly but it will give you the basic image of what we did. Right. I have to imagine this must have been a crazy development cycle because like, uh, you were relying so much on, on Game Maker, right? But also Game Maker itself changed over the years, right? Yeah. That brought a single huge episode of porting difficulties from Game Maker 8.1 to Game Maker Studio 1. That was the most difficult transition. Like if your entire level is like a room, could you open that room in the new version, or would you, would you have to recreate that room in a new version? Uh, everything in like room editors carried over. Thankfully, that was not the part that brought me problems. But like some function changes and structural mm -hmm. changes in Game Maker have been sometimes pretty spicy. I can only imagine. Uh, there was that one. Compile message was like fourteen hundred errors. And I would like to <laughs> cry laughing at it. <laughs> That's the moment where you start losing it. <laughs> so the, gear, the the levels were the, are designed in Game Maker, but what about stuff like the uh, player behavior? Because you have like some very complex and um, not the player behavior, enemy behavior. You have some really complex enemy behavior stuff, where it's like enemies are flying in, and there's like little animation, and then you know, the shooting stuff. How do you design that? Well, the starting push for those usually came from Ebo because he will submit me graphics with some of that enemy animation and enemy behavior. Yeah, usually usually it went like I designed an enemy uh, mm -hmm. in terms of their uh, graphical look and so on. And then I would think what uh, this enemy could do and then I would usually draw a very rough sketch with arrows and text telling how this enemy actually behaves like the, the small mecha enemies in the first stage how they loop around from the background to the foreground yeah it's it was a lot of uh, at, at the very start when I, because i didn't really have any um, proper understanding about the programming or the coding side so I just went with these wild ideas and Ebroski looked at them and was like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> yeah. So you designed first the, the visual style, the visual look of the of the enemy, and then uh, derived the behavior from that, right? Usually, yes. yes. So where did you design the enemy initially? Did you sketch on a piece of paper or did you already make the pixel art? I, I usually started just with the pixel art very mm. there were very rare cases where i might sketch something out but usually i just started doing doing the, the pixel art that that reminds me of that one interview with the iga of castlevania fame when he he, he told in in the in the, in the interview that you basically have to make every asset of your game with the goal that, that it will probably be in the final game. 
<laughs> but that, that, that was he learned from the menu of Symphony of the Night. Because if, if you have seen it and you look at it for a moment, you realize, uh, okay, this might have not been designed properly. <laughs> it is... Uh... It is amazing because when you play Symphony of the Night, it's just it's perfectly functional. But when you're told that the menu is a placeholder, you let it and go, "Oh, holy sh! It is <laughs> that information is unlocked instantly." <laughs> Very different lens to look at the game through. That's amazing. I didn't even know that. That's great. Um, okay, so so the workflow was um, Ebo makes some pixel arts, comes up with some kind of like rough sketches of how the enemy will behave, and then Broski takes over and hard codes that behavior in in a game maker, right? Yeah. So you wouldn't be able to actually see the behavior of the enemies um, in the, in the editor. You would have to play the game to kind of see how the, how the enemies will behave when you when you in the game when you play through it, right? Yeah, we don't have a enemy editor or like anything like that. It would just you compile the code, see what it does, recompile, see what it does, recompile. So I guess like in, because we had previous in interviews with with developers using Game Maker, so I guess that's kind of like our for like our first interview. We had uh, uh, Barkok here, and he had kind of like used kind of like a very similar technique there. Mm. Um, did you use anything to kind of like, because, okay, with enemies I can understand, but what about bullet patterns? Uh, that is the age-old question. Uh, there's no simple answer for that, but like... I think it started, uh, at, at the beginning it was more, uh, I, I, when I designed the enemy and uh, I just gave ideas how the patterns should work, and stuff like that and uh, as the game went long and uh, i started getting more uh, into the actual design and made more detailed uh, pattern yeah. ideas and sketches how the boss should move or uh, when it, or how the pattern should follow from one from the other and i think it's pretty evident if you look at the very first uh, stage bus versus uh, spoil <laughs> spoilers grapefruit uh, fight in the second loop that actually has an AI and it thinks and it reacts to your movements. But yeah. that's also part of the fact how our skill level gradually uh, rose during the development and mm. especially how April got more uh, wilder with, with the boss uh, patterns and actions. Yeah, another way I like thinking about the patterns is not actually using the word patterns, but attacks instead. Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like patterns has a slight danger of you starting to think in the way of bullets only, mm. instead of like movement of the enemy and like what it wants to do instead of only shooting these kaleidoscopic patterns like in Toho. Which is all fine and dandy in itself, but like, yeah, for, for me, thinking thinking bullet patterns only feels limiting. Yeah, I think that one one thing that when I play through the maps and and now that we have uh, developed uh, continued the development is that I would I'm trying to in my mind think how much uh, this. Boss reminds me of just a turret or something that just is shooting stuff. Does it? Do, oh yeah. Does it do actually anything, or does the boss's design actually affect uh, the gameplay at all? That's a really good way of putting it. Like, is it a glorified turret, or like, is it designed to do what it looks like it does? Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a really cool way to think about bosses, and it totally makes sense if you look at at the boss design of of Zero Ranger. Like, you always feel like you're fighting somebody, right? Mm. Yeah, I hope it does. Hopefully, uh, you mentioned something there that that gave me some pause. So I have to think about it because ten years is is a long time to do to work on one game, and so 
how did that go? Like, how did you like for the first four years work on the first level and the next level, or or did you like finish the game all the way through and then did more refinement passes? Like, how how was this? How did you go about creating the the game? I, uh, there was a bunch of refinement passes. Yeah, I think I drew the graphics at least three times over. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you said they were, should be final. I think there. I think there is like one enemy that remained unchanged this whole time. Uh, which one is it? The missile one. The small. Uh, the small. Holy shit! It is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, but it got new thrusters, fl flames. So yeah. Oh, okay. So different particles. Uh, the to be fair, Zero Ranger was has been a bottleneck where. Every change had to go through me, hmm. and uh, that that kind of made made it really slow if I didn't have the time for the game to program, or if I was doing music or anything. Uh, so, Ebo sometimes simply had nothing else to do than like refine the graphics further and further. Yeah, and it hmm. often might result in a completely different boss design. <laughs> Yeah, but redefinement is good. So, um, when you were designing all those those enemies, where you you also were designing levels, did you have like um, like I'm I'm trying to understand you know exactly what, what design process did you have like a a plan for how the entire game would plan out, and then you you kind of like refine the plan more and more, or did did you like design one level and then okay what can, could could come next? Like, did you go one level after another, or did you? Did you start with an end vision of then for the entire game first? At the beginning, we really didn't have a, a big layout how the levels would progress. It was just um, first stage doesn't have really any huge gimmicks. Then the second stage introduces uh, stage hazards and stuff like that. But uh, I think what, uh, when we when we started play Escados. Back in the day, we realized that uh, how, how much more coherent the stage designs could be overall. So we made these small transitions from at the beginning, uh, from from the end of the each level to the beginning of the, the next. So it feels more cohesive, and and all and as we went along along each stage. I think we get got progressively more. Um, we started to plan more each stage. Uh, that how yeah, we got more ambitious. Like if the first stage was just like we just plot these enemies over here, oh, that's good, okay. And then the, uh, when we started the last designing the last stage, we actually mapped out pretty much all the way to the end how that stage would work. And just dropped some ideas that made the stage too long. <laughs> Fascinating. So you kind of like you evolved your uh, your um, work process along the way as you continue working on the game, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think you were talking about like a grander vision for the game. I'm not sure if that existed until we were working on stage to the. And Ebo oh. started thinking very hard about what this game should actually be about. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting in in retrospect because it, I think it, it unlocked some part of my brain. It, at least at least for me, it made much easier to, when, when I knew how a stage would progress overall, and uh, you kind of plot out this. Um, and entire plot: How, why, do, why do these enemies appear right now, and what happens? Exactly. What happens when you enter this part of state, and why should this boss come from here, and so on and so on? It, at least for me, it it became a good way. If I felt stuck with the actual design of the level, it, it was much easier to just think about it in it, almost in terms of narrative, how the stage should uh, conclude and uh, what what would be the actual high points of the stage. 
Yeah, and that's why in my head canon, I think Ebo is the main designer for Zero Ranger because he plotted out the main plot and like made the canon, so to speak. And it would it just kind of fit all the design so well. You are too kind. <laughs> I'm I'm just the programmer. <laughs> but hey, and now you hey, are hey, hey. I think that now that I have started uh, learning programming myself, paper steps and all. I think that ultimately programming programmers are the the final say. I have the final say on the game design because it is true because it because there is always something lost in translation when there is a different designer and programmer. The dis- uh, the programmer always has to uh, kind of divine what the uh, designer wanted. Yeah, they have to interpret. Yeah, but, but it's not a bad thing at all because when I in Zero Ranger when I introduced Ebro an idea and how something should work, he would usually do something a little bit more, a little differently, and I think it was pretty much always a better case. Yeah. I mean, th- that's that's totally something that happens and you might have some like a cool idea on paper and then during the implementation you refine that idea or you maybe you know, twist it in a slightly different direction that works better. As the idea comes alive, you kind of have a way of, of shaping it, right? I did some research on, on like uh, some, some other interviews that you guys gave and I saw some really spicy, like, is, is that the kind of, I'm not sure, is that, is that the kind of... A design that you went through with the enemies because I saw some really amazing like paint uh, diagrams of you know how a boss fight should play out. Did you see the placeholder face? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Or, or at least I saw like this, this the the, um, the enemy that that crawls behind the the, the player like the, the the skeleton enemy right the, That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's an amazing. So is that how you communicate? How you designed all of the encounters? With the, yeah. with the more complex bosses, yeah. And if, uh, there there is a funny story with this particular boss because when we visited, it was how many years ago when we visited last time? Uh, this one small, uh, well, I don't know if it's small. If I could, I would want but a small arcade in Helsinki called Sukhoi. Yeah. And we were just trying out different uh, arcade cabinets there. And then Ebro started playing this one Iron game in the hunt. <laughs> do you remember Ebro? Oh, I do. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I arrived a, at a certain crawling boss design and I was like, oh, <laughs> I see. This looks familiar. This. <laughs> This do be looking familiar. <laughs> and uh, Zero Ranger has a lot of nods in its design for like arcade and non arcade games and media in general. But they are like slightly obfuscated. So they, they kind of fit in the general canon of Zero Ranger. That just mm-hmm. sometimes you might be watching a cartoon and seeing like, hmm, that looks a little familiar. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really fun to just like uh, to be like, wait a minute, I didn't recognize this, and this kind of like seems like this, you know? Yes, it's, it's like this collection of of reference. That's why I felt like this this was. I mean, not just about schmas, but also from like I don't know the intro, like the um, the intro sequence, like reminds me of uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion with like the, the flashing text and so forth. Oh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Yeah, it, it's actually was, uh, actually. Uh, the more direct reference would be Daimaho, but yeah, Daimaho. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, rising sh- shoot them up. I think it's called Maho Ma- Maho Kusen or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the great Maho Dai Sakusen or something. Yeah, uh-huh. and uh, interesting. Yeah, Zero Ranger does wear its inspiration on its sleeve. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the 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 fun the thing that I found the cutest, I think, was um. The, the computer that you talk to, like uh, it's Eurasia, right? It's Eurasia system, right? Yes. Uh, that's the PDP-1 computer, which is where Space War was released on, like the first shmup, so to speak, yes. or the first shooting game. That's very, very nice and cute. Yeah, I keep forgetting about that one. <laughs> uh, they just go so deep. Mm. 
Right. So um, going back to like your design process. So, uh, so so you kind of like make like these kind of like little drawings for for how uh, enemies behave or how boss fights play out. Did you do this same kind of planning for? Um, because like the the levels are like these very distinct, very memorable encounters. Did you plan those encounters as well this way around? Well, uh, the later we went, yeah. Especially stage four is. I think I remember we mapped out it in some kind of on online drawing sketchbook. Yeah, collaborative. And it, it has some cur it has some curse placeholder art. <laughs> Which, I'm not sure I, wonder I feel comfortable should. sharing it with anyone else. <laughs> if you don't want it, I, don't, don't. I will have to look at it in advance and decide later. <laughs> you have to do like a vetting process. Right, so at the beginning it was more freestyle, you designed the levels more freestyle, and then as you went on you, you tried to tighten up your... Because it was more about where is this game going, well, what, what are we trying to achieve, right? Yeah, because at the later stage of development we actually had an idea where we wanted to go with this game yeah. and there and we had certain goals we had on the to read so it made sense to have a much a stricter idea of course we left some leeway in there and lots of ideas were just dropped and uh, it, it's kind of funny to think how long the stage four would be if we had included all the ideas in it See you in Black Onion, everybody. <laughs> ah, we're going to talk about this later. I'm actually very eager about this. That's good. <laughs> so um, something that just is kind of like always a bit of a, um, a question that I ask everybody uh, um, that I invite here is like, how did you decide uh, about the length of the game? Your uh, Zero Range has four levels, kind of, depending yes. on maybe five, depending on how you count. Mm -hmm. uh, and... So how did you arrive at that number? Is that something that, that you had there from the beginning or is that something that you kind of like figured out as you as the game became more clear where it's going? Um, did you have a feeling for how long the game should be or how, how did you arrive at that? I think a major component was that we have to cap, it, cap this at four so we can actually end this project someday. <laughs> so it's like... Less than 20 years. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, uh, also, I think it it felt more appropriate. Because I, 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 I think we ha had the idea of the second loop very early on. Rel That's rel true. Right? Yeah, extremely early. Because one of the earliest ideas that got into Zero Ranger was the power-up system. Where you would get power-ups as you go through the stages and it made a lot of sense for having a second loop because the stages would be immediately different because you would be more equipped for the earlier stages where you wouldn't have those weapons so, and from then on i just started pumping differences into the loops just to to keep it spicy. Yeah, I also felt like this this thing that you get like the permanent upgrade. I felt that was also worked well with this idea of making the game accessible because that's something that I think a lot of players are getting uh, stressed out about for good reasons. Whereas, like when you get hit, you lose your weapons. <laughs> yeah, and it's a good way to introduce players different systems. If you would, for example, in Radiant Silver Gun, you have seven weapons at the very start, and it's really mm. overwhelming. It's it's really fun once you figure it out. But just figuring out uh, all the button combos and stuff makes it very intimidating. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's true. Yeah, some of the shops have like really complex movements and systems. You have to understand everything at once, and you're already struggling with a game, and then you also have to figure this stuff out. Yeah. So that's a that's a nice way to kind of like break everything down for the player and introduce them one by one to the systems. Yeah, it, yeah. it might make things a bit less hectic for more experienced player players but considering that we had we try to keep things on our skill level as well that that kind of also affected how hard the game ended up being also I, one thing i want to say about the power ups when you talk about them being really good for the accessibility 
that I don't think that was a conscious choice to introduce the weapons like that, but we just did it because it was cool. <laughs> and fit the initial theme of the game, which was like, uh, this player wants to become the final boss. Right, so it's your, the initial name was Final Boss, and I mean, it says at the beginning when you launch the game, like, this is a story about the fighter yeah. who wants to be become yes. the final boss. Yes, but it says Zero Ranger. Oh, that's right, that's right. Why? Play the game to find out. Okay, so we talked about how you kind of like had to kind of decide, like you you capped the, the game length at a certain length just because you know you you just had so much ideas you would be developing it for ages until until you arrive there. But what about um, things like you know the speed at which the ship is moving and you know the speed of the bullets, the, the speed of the enemies, and so forth? How did you find these things out? Were these things that you um, you basically did by gut feeling, or did you study other games to compare it to? Uh, I think from the start, w one thing was uh, that w because we wanted to make game like Guxt, so we knew mm. for sure that it wouldn't be anything like a actual bullet hell or Danmaku. There's, I have to, I have to ask because like the the game, I mean, it's a bit of a spoiler, but the game for a very brief moment turns a little bit into a Danmaku. Was that kind of like you making fun of Dan Marco a little bit? Yeah, well, it was a, it, it's what it was kind of cheeky <laughs> on our side. It feels very cheeky. It was cheeky, but it also serves the purpose of like showing this is not this game. Yeah, this is a very different kind of game that is not this game. You know? Yeah, it, 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 it feels wrong when it, when it happens. It feels like oh, that's not right. That's that's not the game I was playing. That's a different game now. Yeah. So you use Gax as a as a template for for this movement of the ship and and so forth, like the, the general feel of it, right? Yeah, uh, because uh, at the start there wasn't a focus button, but uh, it was later ad added as an uh, optional thing because some players like to have the full control. And probably can tell more detailed answer how we came up with that. Yeah. Uh, Zero Ranger as a whole is designed as a game where you go fast and you don't have to go slow. The ship speed kind of settled in very early. I put in some values and we kind of never touched them until the final stretch of development where we slightly increased it for the better. Wow. Uh, I, I think it was a fairly common feedback actually from people like Sega and Zarok where they felt like it should be a little faster and the fact that the ga final game has a slowdown button is actually because I added an analog support analog control support for the game very late in development and uh, with analog stick you can go slow basically so I was mm -hmm. like well if you want this feature for your digital controllers, I think you should be able to have it even if you don't need it necessarily. So that's why it is an optional button in the game. So you have analog control, so you can also go not just in eight directions, but like in between directions as well? Yeah, uh, 16 wow. in total. Whoa! It is that's... segmented. Oh, okay, so it is not fully fluent. Yeah, I, I'm happy with how that turned out. I, my main inspiration for that was uh, Grady's 5 on the PS2. Because in that game, your X and Y axis movement, I think, is segmented in like three speeds. So I basically took that and made it two speeds. I think it hits a very good middle ground in feeling snappy and digital while still allowing you to move a little freer. So, so do you have like any kind of challenges that you designed specifically for this kind of type of movement? Not at all. Everything is designed for you basically moving with a D-pad or stick or what ah, have okay. you. So like you being able to go a little slower is just extra. That is there to make it feel a little better, but no challenge is really designed for you to have to use that focus button. Mm -hmm. Zero Ranger is a game about moving in like a big patterns instead of small. Very little tap dodging, even though there is some of that. 
Um, so, or, or, or maybe like to continue that that kind of train of thought. Did you, when you designed the different challenges and so forth, did you have a certain path in mind or a certain solution, so to speak, to all the challenges that you set the player in front, or did you say like, okay, here's the challenge and let the players figure it out? I did kind of test like everything had a fun enough answer. And one thing that we kept in mind while was the fact that you had to still be able to complete the game just with your regular shot. So that sort of acted as a bottleneck how crazy uh, 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 situations could get. Exactly. Because we can't be sure about what specific weapons you picked. Only your it, main shot. Yeah, it helps, it helps to keep your design clean and, and also fair. Because you can't be sure if the player ha when when they come into the situation if they have a lock on or a charge shot. Uh, there were some points where we we would probably notice that okay this is much easier with charge, but that's okay. That doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be always so that every weapon is good at every spot. But uh, it yeah. it leaves a lot of leeway for player expression. Um, so I was wondering also maybe if um, when you designed the different abilities, the different shots, is that some where, when did that came in uh, come in? Did you already plan this very early on, and then you know you designed the, the the levels and so forth, or is that something that changed later on through development? Uh, that is something that was within the design very early on. Yeah, we only one of the weapons changed mid development. We want, from the very beginning, we wanted to have different weapons. And uh, as we went on, the design got more, re more re defined because uh, we started to think, okay, uh, how these weapons, weapon pairs, basically, would complement each other and what kind of strengths and weaknesses they would have. And uh, we tried to avoid uh, some overlap between them. Yeah, one good example of that is that the main shot used to have a, well, it had like two shooting modes. As it is in the release version, it's just like the Vulcan fire, but like a very old build also had a laser when you tap the button that would yeah. pierce enemies. The problem with that, though, was it would kind of obsolete the charge shot. Mm -hmm. So we just threw it away. <laughs> that's great. No, but it's actually super interesting to hear that. So you, I mean, that's maybe to, ex to be expected when a game takes 10 years to develop. But it seems like you did some changes to to the player's ability. So you changed a little bit how the shots work. And you also tweaked the speed a little bit. And I, I would imagine that was a bit of a scary situation, right? Because then maybe some things might break. Yeah, of course, there's always, like, the, always, there's always the chance when you... The longer you are, uh, you have been developing the game, and if you start making more drastic changes to your player characters' actions, there is a chance that something might break. But there is also a chance things get more funnier that way. Uh, it's better to err on the side of the player being a little too powerful than a little too weak. Yeah. So in in that sense, increasing the player speed was like kind of an easy decision. So um, that also maybe fits into a different question that I had, which is kind of like the question of the difficulty levels. So um, which difficulty, like, how did you design the difficulty? Because you can't, I mean, you're talking about how you, you want to maybe create like a more difficult version of the game and so forth, but how did you settle on, on you know, the normal difficulty? Hmm. Like did you make it an easier version of the game, and then you added more enemies and kept adding until you felt it was right, or did you kind of like create something uh, like crazy and then tone it down? I think that the way both of us like to up, uh, uh, um, well, how both of us liked uh, difficulty sections in games, uh, I think we both want to see more drastic changes to the actual uh, structure of the game, not just that uh, enemies have lesser HP and or they shoot more bullets but also that there are some uh, different behaviors yeah I really think that way too 
So you just um, so because like in the sec second loop, for example, the game becomes like a lot harder. So and but also not hard in the sense that the enemies just like have more HP or something, but they really behave differently. Yeah, yeah. That that was one of the goals of the second loop to make things more interesting. And uh, do you remember ever when we added the actual rank for enemies? Uh, it was during the final stretches when. When we realized we are really not able to ship, uh, we're not going to be able to ship white vanilla and black onion with the release version, but like we did have some difficulty variation. Uh, for anyone not aware, white vanilla and black onion is what Zero Ranger basically calls easy mode and hard mode. It's it's funny because I I wasn't sure if white vanilla was was easy because it doesn't really say that this is easier. It's just I think the the wording that you use is very not quite clear. Yeah, yeah, I think it I think it has a more of a different experience. Even if it, it uh, ultimately might feel easier just for the fact that it's much shorter and one loop. Um it still has some hooks even more experienced gamers. Yeah, it's basically the very extreme of our ideas of what what a difficulty mode should offer. So it became a different campaign almost. Yeah, that totally makes sense because it's like it's exactly what you just said. Like it's yeah, sure, it may be easier, but also like it's just a completely different mode. It works differently. It um, like I felt reminded because I think you mentioned this before. Um, Judgment Silver Sword. Mm. Where it's like this idea that you have like these very small chunks that you don't have like you do have a big level, but also everything is um, in um, like split into like these small encounters that are finished, and then you get a score for that chunk, and then the next chunk begins, right? Yeah. Is is that where it came from? The from Judgment Silver Sword? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that, that and Eskatos and. Uh... A dash of platinum, platinum games ranking systems. Yeah, uh, white vanilla is just a very elaborate way of saying by Eskatos. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I can, I can, I can uh, underline that as well. I can. I want to return a little bit about to that uh, rank discussion we had earlier. Yes. So rank, as in dynamic difficulty, one of the big inspirations was hearing about how Resident Evil 4's dynamic difficulty works, is the old version. Uh, it is, it kind of struck to me because I never noticed that game had a dynamic difficulty setting, which means the, it did its job. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's the best kind of, um, because the rank uh, management can be a bit divisive among players if you have... Uh, if you have played Battle Character, you know what we are talking about. And yeah. the idea was just add some spiciness to the mix, not to, make, not to make the game about controlling the rank. The way I would balance the rank, and I know people pretty easily notice when Zero Ranger starts going harder on you, which is like, well, I, I don't mind. There's actually two components to that rank, and mostly nobody has noticed the other part of the rank which is like the dynamic portion and the other one is the pattern portion mm -hmm. so the pattern rank is roughly divided into four different difficulties and that is what dictates if enemies sh start shooting more bullets at you so so every enemy has like three different um kind of attack behaviors and depending on which rank you're in it will be less aggressive or more aggressive yeah except for but it, it is kind of enemy dependent on like where on which level of rank do they start being more aggressive but like when you have a lot of enemies you don't have to make individual behaviors for every one of them to notice the difference and, uh, and this... Yeah, what is the second aspect of the of the dynamic difficulty? Uh, it is a more dynamically shifting value that actually, when you're doing well enough, it doesn't affect the game at all. But like, if you're in really big trouble, it slows down bullets a little and reduces enemy health a little. 
but ah. it tries to do them in such numbers that you will actually never notice. But the game will give you a slight push. If you're like basically figuring out a boss, then you will beat it just a little faster. And maybe the next time you face that boss, you know how to beat the boss and you don't need the training wheels anymore. Interesting. Yeah. So there, so there's like two aspects. One is like, like designed, pre-designed difficulty, uh, dif- uh, dif- attack patterns, and the other one is kind of like more, uh, actually playing around with the values, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the thing that changes in White Vanilla when I told you that uh, the dynamic rank value doesn't actually affect bullet speeds if you're doing well. It's not actually true in white vanilla because <laughs> white vanilla bullet speed is uncapped. It can go faster and faster and faster depending <laughs> on how you play. <laughs> and it is extremely evident in the final boss of white vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> Where I actually had to add a special case for a bullet pattern to like <laughs> cut that back a little <laughs> because uh so if you're playing really well it can be just like just shooting across the screen like like crazy? Yeah, like lightning speed bullet. <laughs> you, you can watch a high level play of White Vanilla and see what I mean. Oh, that's amazing. It gets crazy. Yeah, that's super cool. So, um, but it's kind of funny that you, okay, so you I guess you designed the first loop first and then the second loop, like from the main game, right? And then the second loop on top of that, right? And then, but then you create like the easier, the vanilla version afterwards, right? Yeah. Okay. And now you're creating the, the harder version. Yeah. So that's something that's, that's it's not released yet, as I understand. It's the Black Onion, right? Yeah, it's not released yet. And uh, don't expect to release fast. I will. I have said this in Zero Ranger Discord, that is now the System Erasure Discord, but uh. We won't have a big anniversary patch this year, so don't look forward to that. Our, all of our time has gone into Void Stranger. It is time to get the gear going on Black Onion, finally. I mean, to me, it's great news that you, you're still on it, that uh, Void Stranger is not, that you're not moving on to Void Stranger and leaving uh, Zero Ranger behind. Yeah, yeah. But let's just say that life got in the way. It has been, it has been pretty tumultuous few years these things that that's that's what what tends to happen with life going back maybe to to um kind of like the the difficulty stuff so um you were talking uh, very much about you know how um you designed the game you know um um, to fit your skill level so to speak of your of your shmup or your understanding of shmups and you also said that you were not a, a particularly you know super high score mega players um did you beat your own game like is that was that part of the um um uh release process to kind of like try to one cc before you release it did you april did you that's (laughs) so there's a i had a few streams after i released a zero ranger where i tried to one cc the game and somehow every time I failed. <laughs> I know it's possible, and I've put more hours in Zero Ranger than probably anyone on this planet. But uh, yeah, I also made Zero Ranger to like enable my risky play style. Mm. So I I play very dumb and unsafe, and that that kind of blows up in my face. So my answer to Ebo's question is uh, probably. Please never ask that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I think it's it's like a it's a funny situation because it's like you know you probably can easily check you know if this section of the game is beatable. You can check if this section is. You can put it you know check check in each part of the game individually. But like putting it all together is kind of like a very different skill to some extent because you have to be like very consistent you know and so forth. Exactly. And uh, people should be able to beat their own game. Let me just say that out, out loud. Yeah, or at the very you, least, as I uh, say, not. Or at the very least, you should you should have very good playtesters. That yeah, yeah. That, that helps a lot. I mean, with the schmuck community is especially different, difficult because like the the skill level among the schmuck community is so high, right? It's true. So, 
so you I'm a, you kind of have to get up to that level, but then there's always going to be some kind of person who's like, what is this baby game, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can't help that. Um, but you, uh, I, from what I understand, you had a lot of playtesters on board who kind of like advised you and, and, and gave you feedback on, on the difficulty level. That's how you developed uh, that part of the game, right? Yeah. Uh, the playtesters play mostly, uh, the biggest help was usually not necessarily making uh, things more difficult, but more interesting. If there, is what, uh, oh. um, if there was a, a certain pattern that always just uh, do the A then to the B, and then yeah, like if you could autopilot that. Yeah, usually we would add some slight randomness or or make the pattern slightly more interesting in other ways. Interesting that 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 is the feedback that came in, huh? Yeah. It wouldn't be that they would always talk about that, but we would see what they do on the videos, and we were like, we can't allow that. Uh, yeah, if, if uh, for example, if if playtester would simply remain in certain place and not really move that much, we would add something uh, to motivate the player to move a bit more. Mm. So one part of difficulty is also like the scoring part, and I already heard from other interviews that that's also something that changed a lot during the development, that you had a very different scoring system at early on. Well, our initial scoring system was like coincidental. I was like, hey, if uh, each hit, regardless of how much damage it did to enemies, gave exactly one score, then there would be some strategy in like what weapons would you would use and the strategy would be that you would always use the weakest weapon so that was bad that doesn't seem like a great scoring system yeah it was not good it was bad but we tried that and we was like well that's not bad and i think evo came up with the combo system and we rolled with that and it was great it's fine it's fine <laughs> Is there any kind of game that yet you were inspired by when, when you chose the scoring system? Well, Dodo Batsy is probably the most obvious one. and but, but we made the cap relatively low just to make sure that not every single small mistake will completely destroy you like in Dodo Batsy. Yeah, actually the biggest tweaks overall to the scoring systems were like accommodations to mistakes that like if your mistake was small, it, it should like be represented in the code. I mean, the score. Hmm. So like it, it used to be kind of like regardless of how bad you dropped it, the combo, your score was just like obliterated. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think about scoring system, like like how uh, you know how they reflect the the kind of like mistakes or the kind of like achievement that you're that you're doing that that uh, a small mistake shouldn't shouldn't mean the end of the run right yeah i find it really interesting just to like think about scoring systems even though i don't i don't necessarily like designing very overtly complex scoring systems but when there is a scoring system in place i would i like to think about the edge cases and whether to encourage them or like discourage them. One of these examples is uh, in White Vanilla, I think there's a point where having more lives, like having more than three lives doesn't matter in that mode because you don't get a cumulative bonus based on if you have max lives and still keep gathering more lives. Uh, Green Orange has that, but White Vanilla doesn't because getting hit is a punishment big enough mm -hmm. to itself. So I thought like having a max life bonus would be kind of toxic. Like it would validate invalidate every other kind of run that wasn't max life. Yeah, you get the, kind of the same problem like with with other games that have like bombs, where it's like you get extra points for not using bombs, but then it's like it's weird because then you're not supposed to use bombs anymore because that's how you get the high score. It's kind of weird, right? Yeah, that's a huge dilemma with games that have a bomb scoring system like that. At least for me, I don't kind of 
I don't like that you are presented with a button that, like, on higher level, you shouldn't use or express yeah. yourself with. I, I ask I to find that often I, I can see that the idea that the bump button is supposed to be a small, it, it is a smaller penalty than taking a clear hit, but it, it, it often leans into too much, into the just being perfect and not doing any mistakes. By the way, it's kind of weird, or oh, not weird, but it's unusual for, for Schwab that, that Zero Range doesn't have any bombs. Uh, is that something that you consciously designed, or is that just like it never came up? Well, the power-up system already has a lot of weapons. So there, first of all, there necessarily isn't space for a bomb function. You'd have to add a button for that. Like, we could have designed it in if we wanted to, but the second thing is that we didn't want to, uh, on based on the aforementioned reasons. And it gives the Ranger a really unique flavor when it doesn't have bombs, but it instead compensates by giving you a lot of extra lives. And other tools as well, how to handle bullets. Yeah, there are actually... A few of the weapons are like small bombs so to say they have a little bit of invincibility and like ways to make bull make bad bullets go away <laughs> yeah like you have like the charge shots and the the drill and so forth that slows down the bullets yeah and like type c swords specifically when you transform into the sword sword form uh it is like a local bomb because the very instant you press that button, you become invincible until the swords come out and the swords dispel bullets. So mm. you can treat that as your bomb button. Interesting, interesting. Not even mentioning type B charge. <laughs> type B charge? Uh, that is a uh, type B charge is the reason why most people have completed Zero Ranger. It is basically a shield. Oh, yeah, yeah, because the, the little thing uh, so soaks up um, bullets, right? Yeah, and it explodes when you overload on them. Hmm. But you get protected, and that is the big, the big selling point. You don't die. <laughs> There, there is a lot of finesse to the weapons. There is like lots to discover and and like it feels like it, it, you, you don't really miss the bomb so much because like when you are in front of some kind of challenge, you have some tools at your disposal. Yeah. Um, okay, so this this gives gets us to a question that I ask um, each one of our guests. This is kind of like a bonus the game design question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a the game design challenge and I want you to answer like from your gut. Like what's your gut feeling here? So, Zero Ranger has uh, quite quite uh, quite um, like multiple attacks and so forth mapped to multiple buttons, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what if you decided, for some very very silly reason, that you are going to work in an engine that only has two buttons? Mm. Um, for example, what if then you want to create like the you want to create like a shmup that has like the typical Denmark stuff where it's like. Um, the normal shot, then a button for slowdown or a focus shot, and then a button for bombing. How would you resolve you know, these three uh, abilities into just two buttons? Uh, would you, for example, opt for something like an auto fire? So you have like the two other options on the other two buttons, and then your ship constantly fires automatically. Or would you still want to have a dedicated shooting button and then try to hash it out differently? I have an answer for this in my mind. I'm curious to hear what Ebo has to say. Hmm. I was starting to think maybe some kind of charge system a la Mars Matrix, where you press the button at different uh, times and there it results in a different kind of shot type. Mm -hmm. Ooh. That's a good question. A good answer. Like Street Fighter One with the pressure sensitive button. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't rule out pressure sensitivity. <laughs> okay, 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 I didn't. But let's, let's assume it's digital, not analog. Okay, okay, okay. Well, honestly, I didn't assume so. Uh, one thing that came to my mind is like, this is actually, I think Dodonpachi original was actually 
a two button game. Yeah. So uh you would have to shoot the rapid shoot, hold to shoot the laser, and uh a bomb to fire the bomb. There was no focus button. It was the laser was the focus. Yeah, it was double mapped on the on the shooting. So when you tap the shooting, then you have fast movement and normal shot. And if you press the shot button, then you go into focus fire and, and um, focus shot. Exactly. So both of you would uh, prefer to avoid the auto fire. Mm, yeah, I think I would design the game around the shot type. I would like go with. If the game had auto fire, I would just like designed it for the auto fire but i i also hmm. okay i vastly prefer the option to not shoot same you you want to be able to not shoot yeah mm, interesting is there any situations in in zero range war where that's that's important uh, there's a particular oh jesus oh yeah, yeah. let's not talk about that if it was like "Quote unquote playing wrong," that you weren't shooting all the time. It's about player expression. I think that one should not be overlooked. All right. Uh, so let's. Just, so that's kind of like all the questions, like the, the design questions I had. So we kind of like we can kind of move on to kind of like, what are your your plans right now? So you just released uh, Void uh, Stranger, um, and you are working on Black Onion. Is that correct? I'm not. Actually, currently, I'm working on the soundtrack release of Void Stranger, and like we are patching up things in Void Stranger, so we'll have to focus on that for a bit. But after that, definitely, probably, maybe we'll see. <laughs> so something I I kind of have to ask because like a lot of people want to know is, are you guys considering maybe in some time in the future to to also go to the consoles? If possible, yes. But I would prefer to, the game to be a finished package before that. Uh, I was just thinking that I might, I would probably want to have a small break before continuing anything else after we have fixed uh, the most uh, I agree. B -b biggest uh, bugs. <laughs> I'm done with that. That's a good idea. I definitely support you on that decision. Looking back, are you? What are your thoughts about um, Zero Ranger and also uh, Void Stranger? Are you happy with the, those games? Are there things about those games that you wished went better? Uh, are there things about those games that you that went a lot better than expected? Well, just like with all art, it it isn't really finished. It's just abandoned. And uh, everything that you make is ultimately just a compromise of your original vision. And uh, that, that can be pretty hard pill to swallow. Uh, I, I think that Zero Ranger, considering all the time that went to it, it turned out okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very understated. <laughs> In terms of Void Stranger, I'm glad I got it done. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm too close to the release to really tell if I'm actually happy with the end result. For now, at least. But it was a very valuable lesson in terms of getting my feet wet with game maker and programming. What about you, Prosky? I'm very happy they are out there and done in quotation marks again but like it resonated with me a lot maybe a little more than Ebo intended when he said uh, all art is not done but abandoned because I know I'm a little guilty about tampering with art you are I think the very definition of a helicopter parent who <laughs> yeah <laughs> He said this in one chat, and I was like, he has a pretty damn good point. <laughs> so, uh, I'm when, when Zero Ranger released, I was like, the soundtrack is finished yet. And it took like uh, one more and a half year to me actually finish the soundtrack. Well, that was a good chance to ship White Vanilla as well. So, like, it, it was a good opportunity. 
but I'm with I'm like way more lax with Void Stranger's soundtrack. I'm not going to adjust it as much as I did with Zero Ranger. Yeah, I, I guess like as a as a creator, you have to kind of uh, one of the biggest challenges is to learn how to let go, right? Yeah, and I'm still learning. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, t- totally understand. Yeah, so um, I, I, that's pretty much it, all the questions I had prepared. Um, maybe just like to to finish things up. Where can people check out your work? Where they can pe- where can people check reach you if they want to talk to you? I think Twitter is a decent enough platform for reaching us. We also have an email, ugbro at gmail.com, which is U-G-G-B-R-O at gmail. You can, uh, you can find this from our website, uh, made.com. All right. So I, that's pretty much it. So I would like to thank you for, for joining me on this, on this, on this podcast, on this, on this interview. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. I hope thank you can, you for having us. I hope you can assemble something resembling a coherent <laughs> from this, from our ramblings. I'm glad that this didn't expose me because I don't feel like I can actually design levels. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm more of a mechanics tinkerer and programmer, and levels are just an excuse to play with the mechanics. Um, so um, with that in mind, do you have like any kind of last words of encouragement for aspiring shmup devs out there? I kind of thought it's often um, said that everything you made is a compromise. So cherish that and also cherish the mistakes you make on the way, because that's the best way to learn. Yeah, celebrate what you end up with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it became like that. That's cute. <laughs> That is cute indeed. Thank you so much to Ebo and Ebroski for joining us. And you out there, if you have any additional questions, be sure to post them in the comments section. If you like this interview, I have four more interviews of this kind on my channel. Sadly, this is the last video of this interview series, but I might do another round in the future. So if there's any shmup developers that you want me to reach out to, be sure to post that in the comments section as well. I also have a coffee set up at coffee.com slash lazydevs if you want to support my future work. But for now, thank you so much for watching and see you next time around, guys. Bye bye.